Hello, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Tuesday night Bible study of Main Street Baptist Church. Pastor Scholler will not be with us this evening, so we have LC standing in, so we're honored to be with you this evening. We started with a, a prayer concern for this day, and I noticed that the, the list seems to be getting longer, and that just means we get to pray more. Amen. First of all, uh, we get a lot of calls uh, because of my hometown being in West Kentucky as relates to the devastation going on that has gone on there with the tornado. So we want to pray for the families who were hit with the devastating tornadoes last Friday and Saturday evening, Friday night and Saturday morning. Multiple counties in West Kentucky and Tennessee suffered severe damage. There were loss of lives and jobs and widespread damage of property. Recovery, no doubt, is going to take a long time. So be praying for all the families there. And there are a lot of sad stories. And so we just pray God's hand and he is our refuge and our strength. Amen. Yeah. Sister Kristen Gordon informed me and reported in that one of the pastors in Haiti has been kidnapped. Oh and so please pray for his safe release. We ask the Lord to bless that. I want to pray for the family of Sister Valeria Shavers as her funeral will be on tomorrow at Main Street Baptist Church. Visitation at 11 o'clock and a funeral at 1 o'clock. And um, we pray for her family, which is predominantly from Nashville. Also, Treasure Maddox out of, no out of Knoxville, the daughter of Elder Maddox, some of you may remember that name, has surgery tomorrow. And it's asked for prayer. Got a request from Sister Wilhelmina Smith. One of her colleagues, Robin Messner, her 17-year-old son, passed from an aneurysm on Sunday. So we want to pray for her at a time of bereavement. Elder and Sister Jeffries, a familiar name. We want to pray for that family in the death of their nine-year-old great-granddaughter. And she's been on our prayer list for a while, Tiara King, and we pray that the Lord will, will bless him in that. Another part of that prayer for that family is that not only are we praying for the loss of the nine-year-old great-granddaughter, but her mother passed away four weeks ago with a coverage-related incident. So the Lord has, has hit that family, and we pray that you will be praying for the Jeffries and that family. Got a request from Sister Denise Frazier asking us to please, please pray for her granddaughter, Tamaya Jones, in that the majority of her cheerleading team has tested positive for COVID. So pray for that team and that the Lord will bless them. On tomorrow, Dick and Ezra Gaynor is having surgery, so we want to pray for him. Those are the additions to the normal list that we have in, in the both that the past went over on Sunday. And I want to hit still some of those highlights as well. Continue to pray for Haiti and the unrest is there and uh, understand that the American and Canadian missionaries have been kidnapped and a few have been released, not many, but we want to continue to pray for that. And there's also unrest in Afghanistan. So it seems to be something always with Haiti in Afghanistan, so we'll continue to pray. Pray for the Patton family at the death of Mary Patton, sister-in-law of Dorothy Smith and Alice Patton. Their funeral will be Saturday at Pilgrim Baptist Church. Pray for Sister Vicki Evans and her second surgery on her knee will be Monday and pray for that. It's bad enough to have one surgery when you have to go back and do it again. It's even more complicated. So we want to pray for Vicki in that endeavor. Pray for Deacon and Sister Lawson's son, Michael Lawson, who had surgery. Haven't heard what the outcome, what the outcome of that is. We mentioned that on Sunday as well. Continue to pray. Sister Barbara Well, continue to pray for her. She has listed as health concerns. Sister Denise Frazier herself is scheduled for some upcoming surgery, so pray for Sister Denise. Sister Scholler's 
grandfather is in rehab after a recent fall. So we ask you to continue to pray for him. Sister Tanja Cummings is recuperating at home, continue to pray. Sister Bobby Johnson's friend, Teresa Songberg, at the death of her granddaughter and also the death of her brother. So continue to pray for Teresa Songberg. Sister Gloria Bush, his sister-in-law died and want to pray for her brother, Sidney Richardson and that family. Sister Tia Ravens, Nathan, uh, follow up surgery on, on her hand, second time surgery on her hand and we commented to in a text on that that sometimes we have surgery that we think is minor, but I believe that no surgery is minor. And uh, so we ask that she will have successful surgery on her hand. Sister Lawandlin Simpson, her coworker, Kayla Brumley, uh, has health concerns and more medical tests to be done. And Sister Lawandlin is stepping in to ask for prayer for her. Continue to pray for our, our dear brother, Deacon Ed Taylor, continuing serious health concerns there. Pray for Sister George Smith and Sister Eva Smith, who is in hospice at home, and Joyce is the caregiver there. And so we pray for that entire situation. Pray for Sister Eva as well as Joyce, the caregiver. We have members that have experienced deaths recently in their families in the for instance, the Ray and Golden family continue to pray for that family. All members of families that have recently had ill and surgeries and been ill and had surgeries or hospitalized, there's a list and I'll, I'll just read them to you. Sister Shirley Adams, Deacon Will White, Deacon Johnny Owens, Owens Linda Williams, Louise and David Jackson, Andrew Williams Sr., Brother Kevin Bennett, having difficulty with, with rehab on his knees. I had a chance to talk to Brother Kevin. Brother Keith Boo Sanford, he's back at church. Sister Barbara Cookie Bolton. Brother Thierra Yates. Pastor Bob Brown, we see Bob, is, he, he might go down, but he comes back up. Brother James Lenny Thomas. And Sister Dorothy Guy and Sister Shirley Simpson. I saw Shirley log in earlier. We have a sick and shut in list on the widows and widowers in our church. We want to continue to pray for that, that, that lot. And we're thankful for that on last Saturday. We had a chance to go out and, and do a, a light visit with the, the widows that we could get in contact with on Saturday. That was such a rewarding visitation. And I was sharing with a couple of brothers that were with me. And, you go do those visits and you end up being blessed more than people you're trying to bless. That's Amen. really how it happens most of the time. Continue to pray for our, our children, our college students, our teachers and, and staffs at this time of uncertainty with viruses here, viruses there, deviants from the viruses. So we just continue to pray that God's hand will be over it all. And he is our refuge and our strength. So let us bow for a word of prayer. And if you keep the list, Please make the notations and we thank God as he answers prayer. Let us bow. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we bow before you in the blessed name of Jesus. It's so good to know that we can call you, and talk to you, and always get an answer, Master. You've given us the ability to talk to you. You told us that in the name of Jesus, we have a hearing in heaven. And for that, we say thank you. So, Lord, this day, we thank you for a new day's journey. You bless us through the hours of the day, and here we are at night, and we thank you for that blessing. Continue to watch over us, Lord, I pray. I pray for our pastor who's not with us this evening. Bless him and his family as he's away today, and we ask you to bless them. Lord, we, we look at the prayer list, and it seems to get longer and longer, but it's not too long for you. And many times we say, Lord, go by here and go by there. We really don't have to say that because we know that you're all places at all times. And so we just ask you to bless in your sovereign will. You know all things. You're able to do all things. And, and you love us. And that's a great combination for us, Lord. So we say thank you. 
there are particular things that we've called out to you, Lord, and there are more, I'm sure, that are on people's hearts, on people's minds right now. And the great part about it, Lord, is that you know it all. And we say thank you. I pray for the all the situations down in the in the counties in West Kentucky and even down in Tennessee, and maybe even more for the, the tornadoes hit and did multiple damage. And I, I was able to talk to some and they're just astounded with the, the, their, the damage that happened and how fast it happened. And, and many are, have different situations and many are asking questions and, and what we're gonna do, well, we've got to trust in the Lord. He's able to do all things. He knows about all of it. Sometimes people say, well, where was God when all this happened? My answer to them is he was on the throne then, he's on the throne now, and he's able to bless. So we ask, dear God, to, according to your sovereign will, that you hold the people in the hollow of your hand, give them to know that you are our refuge and our strength. We want to pray, Lord, for the family of Sister Valeria Shavers as we, Lord, we'll go through that funeral on tomorrow. We ask that you bless them and hold them in the hollow of your hands. There are those that we've listed that having surgeries even on tomorrow and in the near term. Treasure Maddox is having surgery. Deacon Ezel Gaynor is having surgery. We ask you to bless them through that. There are those that have been added to the list that our members have called it with intercessory requests. My sister Wilhelmina Smith for, for Robin Messner, sister Denise Frazier for her granddaughter whose whole team is, many in the team has come down with, with COVID and tested positive with that. I should say tested positive. I don't know if they've come down and I but being tested positive is a concern. And these days we just ask you to bless that. The families, Lord, that have been on our prayer list for a bit, and we ask you to, to bless at every point. We thank you every time one name comes off. We pray for the, pray for the Patton family, the death of Mary Patton. We pray for Vicki Evans, who's having her second surgery on her knee. Sister Barbara Webb has health concerns. Deacon and Sister Lawson with the surgery of Michael. Pray for Sister Shoulder's grandfather. After a fall, Tanya come is recuperating at home. Sister Gloria Bush's sister, sister-in-law died. And so we ask you to pray for her husband, which is a glorious brother. His name is Sidney Richardson. A tear raven with the second surgery on her hand. LaWanda Simpson's co-worker, Kayla Brumley. Our dear Deacon Ed Taylor. And I always pray for, we want to pray for Sister Eva Smith and Sister Joy says, she tends to her beloved mother. So we just thank you, Lord, that knowing that when we pray, we know you're here. And we're praying to one that's able to do all things. And we're so amazed when we see how you move and, and the things that you do and you love us. And we couldn't have a better situation to pray that a God who is, knows all, can do all, and loves us. That's a great combination. So Amen. Lord, we say thank you. Bless us and keep us, watch over us as a body of believers at Main Street Baptist Church. Watch over us as a church family. Bless us one by one, and then bless us collectively as a body of believers. We pray in a time that we think about the lesson even now, and we think about Jesus Christ. And, and one of the things that, one of the, the honorable names he's given is the Prince of Peace. And so Lord, we ask for peace in our church. We ask for peace all around us and our individual members. and we just ask you, Lord, to, to bless us and keep us as we stand and sit on the corner of Main Street Baptist Church, that we might be a light to this locale. We ask it all in Jesus' name, and for his sake we pray. Amen and amen. So we thank you, and we pray that now we turn to our a duo this evening. Brother Les is going, is going to... Uh, Lead us in song. He has a, a company person. Is that a, do you want them to guess who it is? No, just, just, so we we'll go ahead and tell them. So we have a duo this evening. We have Sister Nina Bond that's, that's come and going to join in with Brother Les, and they're going to entertain us and lead us in, in the song. Amen.
good to be with you here this evening and our lesson for this evening is is uh, those who are able to get the bulletin on Sunday we know that we're coming out of our Sunday school material we have a new quarterly and we'll be coming out of the December 12th lesson which is the second lesson in the first unit of the quarterly for those who understand what I'm talking about the Bible expositor and it's the second lesson. Now, this whole unit, this whole quarter is over the Christmas period. And so that there's a theme that's related to and tied to the birth of Christ. So the theme for the first unit deals with triumph. And our lesson today speaks in this unit, Jesus' triumphant arrival. And so in, in the lesson for today, we have the book, we come to the book of Isaiah. Chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. And the lesson is broken part into two parts. There's an Old Testament part, and then there's a New Testament part. The Old Testament gives a prophetic word, and then the New Testament part gives the word being come to pass. And so we have a prophecy about the Messiah coming, and then the word showing that the, the Messiah has arrived in John 12. So that's kind of how we can understand the lesson. Now, the, the, the title of the lesson in and of itself gives us something to think about. The title is A King Comes Forth. A King Comes Forth. And so if you, what I do is every time I look at a Sunday school lesson, I, I kind of talk, look at the title because the writers picked the title from the text, obviously. But there's a message even in the title of the lesson itself. So when we say a king comes forth, there's some things that are implied there. Number one, it implies that there that the king already existed. So he 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 the person's talked about was king already, not waiting until he comes forth to be crowned king. No, the king comes forth. And so this lesson talks about a divine progression. We see that God, as we see how in Isaiah 9 and 6, we'll get to in just a minute, how God used the prophet Isaiah 700 years or so before Christ came in the person that the Spirit of God led the prophet to make this great prophecy. It's one thing about prophets, you know, we've been taught 
that for there to be the truth of a prophet to the test is, does what that person says come true? And so 700 years before Christ came in the person, Isaiah made this grand prophecy. It's Isaiah 9 and verses 6 through 7. So I want to read those verses. And uh, in the King James rendering, in verse 9 and 6, we find the Bible says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I want to pause where some Bibles run Wonderful Counselor together. He's called Wonderful. <laughs> He's called Counselor, the Mighty God. Notice the definite article the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Let us pause right there for a minute on verse number six, and before we go to verse number seven. I was pondering, as you look at the lesson, and many times I think about this, so you say, Lord, what do I teach to people on a lesson that they already know? How do you teach a lesson that everybody knows? And then I just thought, well, maybe everybody didn't know. <laughs> That's one observation. But then the scriptures speak, and the scriptures will speak to us at every, at every level where we are. And so we just talk about the text. So we look into the word of God and see what God has for us. And if you remember last Sunday, those who were blessed to be able to be in service or to tune in and hear the sermon that Pastor Scholler preached, he left us with a message. He left us with Emmanuel. He left us with God is with us. God is with us. And that, that was a recurring theme in, in the passage and how he ended with that. And that came out of Isaiah 7, chapter and verse 14. And so here again, we just move a little farther in the gospel. Of, in the, I say gospel. It really is the prophet Isaiah, which is often called the gospel of the Old Testament because Isaiah talked about Jesus and his coming more than any other prophet. And so we see in Isaiah 9, verses 6 through 7. Now, as we think about those verses, we've got to set things in context. Notice in verse number 6, the first word is for. For unto us a child is born. So the context here is that going back to verse number 2, coming forward, we see the, the context of who is being addressed. And so I call this passage a prophetic statement, and it's prophecy. Now, one thing that helps me with prophecy, and I pray that it helps you as well, uh, this is an Elkanese definition <laughs> or analogy. When you think of prophecy, I think of a bullhorn. You know what I mean when you say a bullhorn, something that is narrow at the mouth, and, and it gets bigger as it goes out. Well, if you were to turn sideways and look at that bullhorn, and if you were to, to slice it in time, and that would give you to understand that the close end time, that word of prophecy has an impact on the, on the close end time. But as time goes on, the impact gets greater and greater. So 700 years after the time that it was spoken, we find we see the great uh, impact of Isaiah 9 and 6. We see the fact that, that Jesus has come. And in Isaiah 9 and 6, when the prophecy was given, it was a time that the prophet was saying, in essence, he's going to come. But if you notice the words in the text, the prophet was speaking as if it has already happened. So it's a sure word that this is truth. This is what God has told him is going to happen. And so in the setting in Isaiah 9 verses 2, we see the context is that the people who walk in darkness will in, in, in the New Living Trust, they said, we'll see a great light. And the King James said, have seen a great light. So it keeps it in that past tense con uh, context. So the point here is that what's going on in Isaiah 9, when he's prophesying, we find that the people were suffering. 
the people were in darkness. The people <laughs> of, of Galilee were under Assyrian bondage. And so they were at a point where they were in darkness, needing help. And so when you're in darkness, you need a light. You need a light. And so there's physical darkness. There's also spiritual darkness. And so Isaiah was, was giving them a word that would solve both problems. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so the light is none other than Jesus Christ. And so the spiritual message given all the way back in Isaiah 9, using the people of Galilee then as a type. So physically they can talk about it, but spiritually there's also a deliverance that's going to be made to give them spiritual life. That is none other than Jesus Christ. And so as we move forward to Main Street Baptist Church in 2021, we see there's, there are times, though, we're not in spiritual darkness, we're understand, not understanding that Christ has come, but there are times when we have issues in our lives. There are times when there's issues in the church. There are times when, when there it needs to be uh, a closer walk with the Lord. There are times when we need to uh, shine the light on a situation, and that's none other than Jesus Christ. So anytime there's a body of believers, or anytime there's a family, or anytime there's an individual, when there's trouble, when there's chaos, and when there's, there's a time of need, the answer is none other than Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And so we would like to bring that in. So the point here is that the prophecy that Isaiah was giving in 9 and verse 6 as the lesson begins, the lesson I said earlier is broken into two parts. The Old Testament part, which is a prophecy, which gives us a message that there is a Messiah to come. There is a Messiah that surely is going to come, and the scriptures will bear that out. And then the second part would be to in just a few minutes, is that John 12 cites what happened when the Messiah is come. Remember, the theme is, George, is, is the very triumphal entrance of Jesus Christ. And so the New Testament portion that's picked out talks about Messiah's coming, and then he's recognized by the people, and he has a, a, a triumphal entrance into Jerusalem. So hold that thought. That's the, the individual message for the theme of the quarter. And in our lesson today, we see the triumph of the Lord Jesus Christ as he comes into Jerusalem and what happens there. Amen. Now, as we go back to Isaiah 9, verse 6, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. As we look at this passage, we see a couple of things. Number one is that the, the, the prophet Isaiah is inclusive here. He's including himself. He said, unto us. So we see this is very particular that we see the promise of God. And we sang a song, Blessed Assurance. And, and we have an assurance here that there is a word for us. There is a word to us in prophecy and now has come in the very person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the true word is that what God says he's going to do, he's going to do. And the Bible says in, in verse number seven, says the zeal of the Lord of hosts, we're performing it. We're performing it. So we have the very fact that God, by his very will and sovereign will and, and, and plan, is planning to send the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's going to happen. Why? Because God said it. It's going to happen once God's going to perform it. And nobody can stay his hand. And so it's God's zeal, God's desire, God's want to deliver God's people. That's a blessing to us. And so we understand that's God's will, that's God's desire, that's what God is doing. And so then we can rejoice in verse number six, which says, for unto us a child is born, because the intent here is that God is dealing with what we need. We need a savior. We need deliverance from a burden of sin. The People in Galilee need deliverance from being under Assyrian bondage. And we find that even when it comes down to the New Testament passage, when Jesus came, there was still a type of bondage that the people were under, but it was Roman rule. And so we see a parallel going on with people in bondage, and Jesus is the answer in both cases. Amen? And so 
the Old Testament passage, Isaiah 9 and 6, we find that a child is born and a son is given. We've heard these passages many times before, but we must understand that every time we hear and every time we hear the truth, God's word is blessing us. I said Isaiah is inclusive here. Unto us is a glorious to us. That shows that God has not abandoned his people, even in sin then and even in sin now. The solution for sin is none other, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the solution way back in 700 years before Christ was that Jesus is the answer. He was the answer then, and now as time has come forward, and we think about the bullhorn as we go farther down in time, now we see the fulfillment of the prophecy by that God has given the man of God come to pass, and so we see it as being true. A child is born, speaks of the humility, humanity, as well as humility, but humanity of the Messiah. So the Messiah that is spoken of here is a child. So we see his humanity coming in. And then we saw last week when Pastor Show, well, Sunday, when Pastor Show was preaching Isaiah 7 and 14, we talked about the, the Messiah was born of a virgin. So the humanity of Christ comes in, the fact that he was human born, his father's God, yes, but he was born of a woman, made under the law to redeem those that are under the law. So the humanity of Christ is professed in 714 last, last Sunday, and even here again, we say a child is born. So we see the Messiah is human. We also see that, that the Messiah, it also says that a son is given. And the key word for us to see ourselves in the text is just unto us. And you can take this person, I take it person, thank God, that, that before the foundation of the world, think about it, before the foundation of the world, God had you and me and we in mind. Before anything was, was made that was made, God had already sovereignly determined his people, had sovereignly chosen his people. And that's the good news of the gospel. And then because of his knowledge of us and his choice of us and with the fall of, of Adam and Eve, his people, his chosen people were branded with sin, born into a fallen world. And we were in a situation where we could not do anything about it. We couldn't come to God. So thank goodness, God came to us. And so when we look at the first part of, of the lesson, it says the Messiah is come. In, in prophetic is come, in time is coming. Amen? And so we see God is doing and has done what he needed for us because he loves us. A son is given. So we see not only is this child a human, but the child is a man. A son is given. And it's interesting to, to know that not only is the son given, it's not you know, any ordinary son. It's the very son of God. And John's gospel tells us that in John 1, it says that, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. So the son spoken of in Isaiah 9 and 6 is also the son of God. So the son is given. And I'm being kind of very simplistic here, but it's key points we have to get. I say it with the lesson. I said the king comes forth. So there was a king already, and the king, and, and the king came forth. And there was a son already, and the son is given. So we see the benevolence of God, the very grace of God, and the very mercy of God, and they're giving us what we need. We couldn't get to God, so God came to us. And the Bible says he came to us in the very person of Jesus Christ. So the son is given and he comes with a purpose. And the purpose was to solve and solution man's sin problem. And so if we put ourselves into the picture, we understand that we were lost in sin, but it's by the very grace of God, the very love of God, that before the five, before 700 years ago, God put in a solution that he already declared and declared before time was. And in time, he put things in place. And in time, 
that in 700 years, Isaiah said Jesus was going to come. And lo and behold, he came. And we see the scripture that tracks that, and that's called the gospel. Amen. And so we can read the very word of God. And here we are at this time of year where we rejoice about what Jesus, go tell it on the mountain. <laughs> we can rejoice the very fact that Christ has come. And so here we are at Christmas. And many times you, we've heard it say, Jesus is the reason for the season. It's not about sleigh bells and jingle bells and Santa Claus and, and getting gifts. The key point is the gift that was given. So the Messiah that has come is the king and the king came bringing gifts. What gifts did the king come bringing? The king came bringing us peace and salvation. So that's what we have at Christmas. Those are the gifts that God has given, and they are eternal gifts to God's people. Oh, I might get a, a, a necktie or something at Christmas, but that necktie didn't do anything for my soul. Matter of fact, you tie too tight, it might be a problem. <laughs> he didn't do anything for my soul. The fact Jesus came and says a king comes forth. A king who was king before comes in time, coming forth from the very sovereign plan of God, comes forth bearing gifts, two gifts, peace and salvation. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And then it says, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. So here not only is the, the, the one that is being spoken of that's going to come it says he's coming with authority. He's God. Yeah, he, he's a man, but he comes in, in, in the, in the God-man. There's only one. His name is Jesus. And he comes with authority, and government should be upon, the government should be upon his shoulder, meaning that a king, this is further definition of him being a king, is that he has a government, and he has a rulership. And those that are in his rulership, it's all on his shoulder. He controls it. And he has authority over it. So that's the good news about the very fact that Christ has come. And Christ is now here. He has come, has done the work of the Father, has won and brought salvation to God's people, has delivered peace to God's people, the two gifts he come to deliver. And the Bible says now he's on the right hand of the Father, making intercession for his people. And his followers, of believers, you and me and we, are the makeup of the church, and, and the church are the people of God, and he is over us, loves us, and the head of the body. And so the gift that has come forward with triumph is that is the king, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So what does that say to us? It says to us that we who are in the Lord Jesus Christ, because of Christ, we have triumph and we have victory. So when you think of triumph, it, it, it goes along with being victorious. And the world talks about having a triumph over a basketball game or some sports activity. Well, yeah, but in the spiritual realm, that's triumph as well. Triumph over sin. Jesus came and with victory over death, sin, and the grave. That's what Jesus won in his triumphal walk here in, 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 in this world. But one thing we got to think about and understand, which also gives us more praise territory, is that we, we talk about the king and we talk about triumphalness, but understand how he accomplished that was not only being king, but was also being a suffering servant. And so there's a, a dual role that Jesus came as being a servant to be, he is king, yes, but this king, Lord himself, to be a suffering servant, to do the will of the Father. Why? That to save God's people. So when Jesus came on a mission, yes, he came with a purpose. Yes, and that was to save God's people. So we go back to the very root lesson. A son is given. A child is born. There is purpose in those words. And the very purpose is why Jesus came and the work that he did on earth, and he won salvation for his people. So continue on with, with verse number six. We can stay all night on verse number six, but we're going to move on in the lesson. So we see that not only is he identified as a gift? He's identified as humanity. He's identified as the very son of God. He's identified as a king. And then the Bible goes on to give him victorious names. It gives him names of honor. And, and, and the Bible says that he is 
called wonderful. He's called counselor. He's called the mighty God. These are descriptors of his very attributes and the everlasting father and the prince of peace. Notice how those words come in. Wonderful. And yes, it's, it's wonderful because the base word is wonder. So his very birth, his very coming into being, human, humanly speaking, was a wonder. A virgin has a child. That's not what happens normally. It was a wonder by the very power of God. The Holy Spirit came upon Mary and she came with child. And so though she was married to Joseph, the father of Jesus is none other than God himself. And the prophecy of that is, is that in Isaiah 7 and 14, and then the Bible lets us know also in Micah 5 and 2, where the Bible talks about he's going to be born, not only is he going to be born, but it says where he's going to be born, in Bethlehem. So we have prophecy in the Old Testament that very particularly shows us Jesus is coming, he outlines it, and the Bible gives us his very name, and, 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 and Isaiah 9 and 6 gives us his very attributes. Wonderful. And his very coming is wonder. And in Hebrews, it says that wonderful is used in connection to the angel of the Lord. Now, I can't spend a whole lot of time here, but if we were to recall, in the Old Testament, many times we saw one that was called the angel of the Lord. And we are taught that that is a pre-incarnate pre instances of the Lord Jesus Christ. And many times we would see, not many times, two times, we would see that when that aim, that very entity, the angel of the Lord would step into being, he would not identify himself, even though somebody might ask. If you remember that, that in the case of Judges, when Manoah, uh, the, the, back then Judges 13, and his wife was barren, and the angel told her that she was going to have a child. And she came to Manoah, and, and, and told him about it. And Manoah said, well, I got to see this for myself. So he goes back and talks to the angel and the angel gives him the same message. And so then Manoah said, well, what is your name? And, and, and the angel said, why do you ask me my name? And so then Manoah perceived that he was an entity from God and wanted to build a, a, a offering for him and he lit an offering, a burnt, burnt offering, burnt sacrifice. And the Bible said that the angel of the Lord took off in the flame. And so when God answered that way, he is answering your prayers. And so in the Old Testament, we see instances of Jesus pre-incarnate coming. And it always pointed to his coming in, in person in time to be. The angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate of Christ, and all things, the Bible says in Judges 13, that he was called wonderful. And they were also translated as secret. And so his name was wonderful. Yes, he's why you ask me, ask for my name, because it is wonderful. And it is also secret. And so we see the prophets of old keep pointing and all pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So he's wonderful. He's also a counselor. And the very words and think about a counselor. Many times I see Ralph online, we might call a, a lawyer a counselor because they, they bring wise counsel, they bring good words of wisdom that, that have a basis upon which we can we can follow. And and we also understand that uh, I see Sister Minifield, her name, <laughs> I see this saw her picture, lawyer counselor as well. And so it talks about one that God is so gifted, so equipped, that can give good words. Uh, and we see Jesus is the epitome of that. So he's wise, he's a counselor, he is God. And during, during his ministry, we find that multiple times he will give words that would befuddle, <laughs> that's a made up word, isn't it? That they would bind the minds of the Pharisees and, and all those that were trying to trip him up. And they would come and, and bring him questions, but his wisdom was such that he would give an answer that would cause them to walk away shaking their head. The Pharisees, like Nicodemus, like the Samaritan woman, these are examples in scripture 
for they came and in meeting Jesus, he gave them words of wisdom. So he, yes, he's wonderful. Yes, he's a counselor. And then we get to the title, the mighty God. So not only is this, this Messiah identified as a child coming, but he's also identified as God himself, the mighty God. So the fulfillment of scripture coming forth as Jesus came into, into uh, physical being and humanity, he came with the very essence of who he is. He's God and he's man. And the is a definite article and lets us know that the only one, the mighty God. There, there is another, there's not another one to look for, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. The only prince of peace is Jesus. The only everlasting father is God himself. And the only mighty God, obviously, is God himself. And so we see Jesus being the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah, where it talks about God himself. And so Jesus, we find, is God in the fullness thereof and in humanity with two natures, human nature and a God nature, the God man. So we thank God for the very person of Jesus Christ. And so we can rejoice about that. He's the everlasting father, um, prince of peace. And many times, in, especially in the, New Testament, in the New Testament time, and many times during our Christmas season, we talk a lot about the Prince of Peace. And he is. And as he comes, he said, the peace I give you, it, 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 it'll never go away. You, you can't get it yourself. It's given by the very fact that he is a giver of peace. One of the gifts that he comes is when he saves a person, you may weep, peace it doesn't necessarily mean the cessation of war. That's what we talk about when we sign a peace treaty. And, and it, it's all as good as it's sometimes not as good as the paper that's written on. But the point is that it's not an everlasting and binding thing. It has variations that can be broken by man. But the peace that God gives is that nobody can break it. Nobody can take you out of God's hand. Nobody can take me out of God's hand. Nobody can separate us from the love of God that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. So now our peace is in the sovereignty of God himself. The place to find peace is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And peace is only possible for those who know the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we move on to verse number seven, of the increase of his government and the peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with justice and judgment from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord will perform this. I went to that verse earlier because it lets us know is that everything that's been said about Jesus Christ is being proposed by God, is being given by God. The prophet has been so given the ability to, to profess this and, and prophesy this, and God is going to perform it and make it come to pass. So the king that has come and is coming in Isaiah 9, 700 years before, is the king that God has ordained, and he's going to establish, and he's going to rule with justice and righteousness. And that's the key part of verse number seven. If you remember when the angel appeared to Mary at, at the time she had been impregnant, right before she was going to be impregnant, said she was going to be found with child and child of the Holy Ghost. And the angel told her that Jesus was going to rule on his, on his father's throne, on the throne of David, and she reign over the house of Jacob forever. So for a king to rule forever, he's got to have the ability to live forever. And so it gives an eternal qualification of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the kingdom that he's ruling is of his, excuse me, the government that he's ruling is one that of the very attributes of himself, peace and justice and righteousness. Unlike earthly kingdoms where you have kings and they, uh, man makes mistakes and they're unjust and do a lot of things, the Messiah's rule is perfect with perfect justice, 
and perfect judgment. And Christ, understanding that, since we're in Christ, key point for us, he rules with perfect justice and perfect judgment. And so those of us who are in Christ, that, that very righteous character is that which we should pursue after. And we ourselves are following the very word of God and, and being obedient to what he says, because we should strive for that righteous living, that righteous lifestyle, to use judgment and justice and we're dealing with people that we come in contact with every day. We may wonder how uh, Isaiah's original audience dealt with that because they didn't, they didn't see Christ. They didn't know about that he had come. Isaiah was given a prophecy while they were in darkness and they were in light, but the word to them then was to help them and let them know that they must come to the Lord God and he is their help. And so the two verses that were given as prophetic input for the lesson is Isaiah 9 and 6. And then the second part of the lesson is very straightforward in terms of what we've heard about many times before. It's a triumphal entrance into Jerusalem. First part, the Messiah is identified to come. The second part of the lesson, the Messiah has arrived. And now he's walking upon earth. And in John 12, verses 12 through 16, on the next day, well, once again, the, the background says that this comes in, in the time of John, where Jesus has, has traveled from Galilee to Jerusalem, really two miles outside of Jerusalem, to stop at the house of, of Mary and Martha, where Lazarus was there, where he had just he had, had just raised Lazarus from the dead. And so what was going to happen here is that here, here Lazarus is raised from the dead. Here Jesus is with, with the people following him. And so the Pharisees at this point now want to kill both of them, want to kill Lazarus as well as Jesus because they were getting a following. And so in the time of the Passover, Jerusalem was full of people. And that was an audience that wanted to see Lazarus, and they wanted to see the man who raised Lazarus. So when Jesus came into Jerusalem, the Bible said he came riding a donkey, and men said, well, why didn't he ride a donkey? Why didn't he ride, why didn't he ride a big white horse? Because that was not his motif. That was not his purpose. That was not his plan. Yes, he's a Messiah. Yes, he's a deliverer, but he's not the type of the Messiah that the, that the people wanted. They wanted deliverance from Roman rule, but Jesus came to deliver us from sin. In the, the setting and time, a king who was at peace might ride a donkey, but a king who was at war rode a horse. But Jesus came at war, but he rode a donkey. Why? Because it had been prophesied in Zechariah 9 and 9 that your king would come riding on a coat. And in the the, the the colt of an ass, and that was riding on a donkey. And so he. this is a fulfillment of scripture. And in Jesus' life, in his wise counsel, and in the very word of God and will of God, at every particular point was prophesied in the old, Jesus made sure that to er, dot every I and cross every T, and we see the total fulfillment of scripture that points to him coming forth. And so he rode a donkey into Jerusalem. And the crowd wanted to see who this was that raised Lazarus from the dead. Who, who this was that's doing all this, all this healing. And that he must be the deliverer. He must be the one that the Old Testament had talked about. So they came and they came laying palm, palm branches down and laying their coats down and breaking, as I said, palm branches. And so that's why we call Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday gets the name that way because the palm tree and the palm branches were used as a type of celebration, as a symbol of victory, a symbol of triumph. And so when they came, they were saying, Hosanna. Notice what it said in verse number 13. They took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. So they were crying out to Jesus and they were calling him king of Israel. King coming in the name of the Lord. Hosanna means save, 
saved right now. But their concept of saving was not salvation from sin. Their concept of saving was that now here's the Messiah that's going to deliver us from Roman rule, from Roman bondage. But that's the wrong concept. But Jesus didn't come with that message. And Jesus came to bring the message of salvation, the deliverance of sin in the very person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 15 says, in his coming was once again a fulfillment of scripture about he come riding a coat, sitting on an ass's coat. Verse 16, as we come to the very end, once again, the Messiah has come. And verse 16 says, these things they didn't understand, the disciples didn't understand. And there's really two reasons about that. And not that they were so slow, but the point is that things were happening very fast. But the truth of the matter is, they didn't have all understanding because it was not given to them yet. What am I talking about? When Jesus went to heaven, the Holy Spirit came and he became the one that would give knowledge to the disciples about everything that Jesus had taught them and then they began to understand. So the Holy Spirit gives them knowledge and the Holy Spirit gives us knowledge as we read and study the word of God the Holy Spirit gives us to understand the very truth of God. And so we see this lesson. The king comes forth. The king is identified by the very zeal of God. A child is born. A son is given. And he's identified as king. And he rules with a mighty kingship. And he has come and is coming back to rule with authority again as he has a thousand-year reign in the millennial kingdom. And so the Bible talks about Jesus. He was prophesied to come. He has come. He has done the work of salvation for sinners and given us peace and salvation. And he's gone to be with the Father on the right hand of the Father right now, but he's coming back by promise to get his people. And when he comes back and raptures his people to be with him, when he comes back to rule and sets his feet on the earth again, it'll be to be the king in the millennial reign. So the king comes forth. And now we thank God that we can look back at Calvary, but we look forward to his coming again to rescue his people. Amen. Amen. And amen. May God bless the lesson. May God, I pray, give you an understanding, a lot to be covered in a very few verses and a very few minutes. But the point is, in this season, when we talk about Christmas, but the message that the Christian people must get is that Jesus is the reason for the season. The triumphal victory of Christ is a message that we have triumphal victory in Christ. And we can live as people that have victory over sin in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So as we come to, to the end of, of this Bible study, we must wrap up and talk about how we give as we're taught every Sunday and instructed on three ways to give. And we know that we can give online, we can give by mail, uh, we can bring it to the very worship and drop in the in the church box. We just came through a budget series and and we were, we show how, saw how God has blessed us through the year 2021. And, and so we ought to give and be obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. The next point is that as we begin to go, we wrap up with the four points of, of, of prayer. You don't have a slide for that, day. okay. <laughs> for over a year, the pastor has been telling us that we need to pray as a body of believers. We need to continue to do that because it's very appropriate. And we need to pray for our leadership. And we need to pray for the, the giving of the church. And we need to pray for our property and, and, and the parking situation. And then also pray for unity in a time when that, that's one thing that the devil always wants to disrupt. He wants to, to disrupt the one of the very gifts of God, and that is peace. And so when you have, we have the peace of God that the world can't change, but the devil's always trying to upset our peace. And so we want to pray for unity and be one and pray ye one for another, all in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we thank the Lord for that. Found it. Amen. So at the end, 
he found the four ways to prepare for worship. That's oh, not what we're talking about. One. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the one, but that's all right. We identified, I thought you can put up a screen for the four ways, but we've already talked about the four uh, ways and four things for us to pray about. We've done that. And so we want to now, as we, we begin to close in prayer, let us bow. Father God, we, we thank you for our lesson. There was a lot to cover there, Lord, but there was a simple message, the very triumph of our Lord Jesus Christ, the very fact that we have truth, the very fact that Isaiah, we call it the gospel in the Old Testament, Isaiah talked about it, prophesied, you gave to Isaiah the word, and that word was brought to pass 100% as it was prophesied. Other prophets have stated it, and Jesus, in every aspect of his walk on earth, he would go do the things that fulfill the very points that the prophets had said. And now he has come. He has conquered on our behalf. And now he says he's coming back. So we got to trust him for that as well. So as we prepare to, to close this evening, Lord, we, we ask you to bless all that we had talked about, not only in the lesson, but the names that we had listed earlier. Individually, you know, each and every one. And there are families that we, we ask you to pray for. There, there are sickness in, in, in families we ask you to pray for. The funeral in the family of Sister Valeria Shavers, we want to ask you to bless that funeral as well. Bless our pastors, he prepares for that funeral as well. So every point, Lord, we ask you to watch over Pastor Shul as he leads and guides us. I pray that you bless each and every member of Main Street Baptist Church, that we will, will bow to the leadership we have, and that we will work together shoulder to shoulder, loving one another, all about being in, in, at the foot of the cross where we all are even. We thank you for that, Lord. Bless us, Lord, and watch over us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen.